Many of the early church fathers say that Mark's gospel is based on Peter's preaching. If that's the case, it's understandable why an apostle like Matthew or somebody like Luke would use Mark as a source. You can't get much closer to the life of Jesus than through the eyes of Peter. We've looked at what the early church fathers had to say about Mark in a previous video. However, Skeptics like Bart Ehrman say that this whole idea that Mark is based on Peter's preaching stems from Papias, and Papias doesn't know what he's talking about. While I don't think that that argument works, what if I said there was a way to bypass this objection? Are there any internal clues in Mark's gospel that point to Peter being the source? Uh, let's take a look. For starters, Mark mentions Peter way more than any of the other synoptic gospel writers. Mark names Peter once per every 432 words. Now, when you compare that to Matthew, Matthew mentions Peter once every 654 words, and Luke every 670. It's also noteworthy that Peter is the first disciple identified in Mark right at the very beginning of his gospel. He's also the last disciple mentioned in the book right after the resurrection. So what's the big deal about this? Well, scholars like Richard Bauckham tell us that by bookending Peter, Mark uses a literary device called an inclusio. We see this device used in other ancient texts to denote an eyewitness source. Mark's use of the inclusio is a nod to the reader that Peter is the principal eyewitness of his account. There's also little grammatical clues that tip us off that Peter is the principal eyewitness in Mark. About a century ago, a biblical scholar named Cuthbert Turner published an article that argued that Mark gives us Peter's point of view. In order to demonstrate that, Turner points out that there are 21 different times that Mark uses a plural to singular form. The best way to understand this is by seeing a few examples. So in Mark 5, 1 through 2, it reads, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Or Mark 8.22 that reads, And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. Or Mark 11.12, On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Notice that each of these examples have to do with the movement of Jesus and the Twelve. New Testament scholar Richard Bauckham writes, The plural to singular narrative device in Mark meets the test for internal focalization. It is possible to rewrite the passage, substituting first-person forms for the third-person references to the focalizing characters. In other words, the word they could have been the word we in the mouth of Peter, the original storyteller, sort of like the famous we passages that we find in the book of Acts. Also in Mark, we often see that when Peter takes a role as a named individual in a particular scene, readers get Peter's perspective on certain events. They move from not just the disciples' point of view, but from a disciple distinguished from the others. So we see not only Jesus, but also the other disciples from Peter's perspective. For one example, there's Mark 14, 27 through 31, which reads, And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to them, Even though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And in Mark's story of the transfiguration, Peter's inner motivation is explicitly exposed. Mark 9, 5 through 6 says, And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And in the story of Peter's denial, we have a passage where the readers go with Peter into a situation removed from the other disciples. Also, we all know that Peter suffered from some serious foot and mouth disease. Peter was regularly saying something that made him look impulsive and at times just plain goofy. If Mark was Peter's spiritual son, we'd expect him to paint Peter in a much kinder light than the other gospel writers, even if he can't leave all of his flaws out. And as it turns out, that's exactly what we find. Matthew details Peter's failure when he tried to walk on water. Jesus called him a man of little faith, while Mark chooses to leave this incident out. And in Luke's gospel, we read about Peter's miraculous catch during his call. Luke paints Peter as reluctant to obey, and after the miracle, he tells Peter to depart from him, for he's a sinful man. Mark's account omits this event completely. And in Mark, Jesus talks about how it's not food that makes a man unclean, but what comes out of his mouth. Peter, being slow on the uptake, asks Jesus to elaborate. Jesus shoots back, asking, Are you so dull? Mark's gospel says that it was the disciples who asked Jesus for further explanation. Matthew points out the fact that it's actually Peter. And in the story of the woman with the issue 
issue of blood, Jesus asked, who touched me? Mark says the disciples got a little snippy with Jesus. They said, you see the crowd pressing against you and you're asking us who touched me? Luke's version tells us that it was Peter who actually asked the sarcastic question. And examples like this can be multiplied. And then finally, Peter also gives us apparently trivial details that indicate Peter's involvement with the book. Mark is the only gospel writer who tells us that Simon and his companions were the ones looking for Jesus when he was praying in a solitary place. Mark alone identifies that it was Peter who asked about the timing of the temple's destruction on behalf of the other disciples. Also, very interestingly, Mark alone tells us that Jesus came home in Capernaum. Well, Jesus wasn't born or raised there, and Matthew says that Jesus came home and settled in Capernaum in a parallel account, but he doesn't call it home. This only makes sense when we read elsewhere in Mark that Capernaum was actually Peter's hometown. It makes more sense for Peter to refer to Capernaum as home. These little incidental details put Peter's perspective in the account, and it's not as if Mark was extra motivated to put them in there on purpose. So when you put all these particulars together, there is plenty of evidence in the text itself that shows that Peter is the main source of Matthew's account. All of these facts confirm what early church fathers have told us all along. Mark's gospel is based on Peter's preaching.